Thank you for joining today's webinar on blowing up your board is not the answer, why representative boards are in your members' best interest. My name is Hank Kim, and I'm the executive director of NC PERS. Today's program is part of our expanded Center for Online Learning. As we all adjust to the new COVID reality, please bear with us if there should be any technical issues or unplanned background noise during our session. As always, your patience and understanding is appreciated. We encourage audience participation. Please submit questions by using the GoToWebinar portal. However, to ensure that we can cover all our topics, we will hold your questions to the last part of the program. Additionally, in the handout section, you will find a PDF of today's presentation. Our presenters today are Brad Kelly and Peter Landers. Brad is a partner at Global Governance Advisors with extensive experience in strategic planning and large complex organizations. Brad works with board members and managers at public pension funds, as well as public and private organizations to devise innovative executive compensation and governance solutions to existing or anticipated changes, challenges. Peter, also a partner at GGA, supports boards and senior management at public pension funds, as well as public and private organizations with technical insight in the areas of executive compensation, human resource strategy, and corporate governance. Peter's work focuses on forward-looking governance practices and risk management, as well as provide education to key stakeholders on complex compensation systems. Brad, Peter, I'll turn over the webinar to you now. Excellent, thank you very much, Hank. Uh, as Hank mentioned, my name is Brad Kelly. I'm a partner with Global Governance Advisors. We are a North American uh, a governance advisory firm, and we also have been partnered with NCPERS and running the, their accredited fiduciary program for a number of years now, which we've been historically offering twice a year. And now, given the success of our online uh, delivery a couple weeks ago, we most likely will be doing three times a year. So anyone who's interested, we would highly encourage you to take a look and consider taking the accredited fiduciary program Today's session is on something that uh, if you're not feeling the pressure uh, right now, we're anticipating that you most likely uh, will be feeling pressure in the, in the coming months on uh, trying to change your board, trying to um, so-called professionalize your board. We've been working with uh, public pensions for, for decades now, and it is uh, a growing trend that we've been we've been observing and uh, it's something that we've also been helping to to mitigate and, and protect representative boards because we feel that uh, it is by far in the best interests of your pension and your pension members. One of the benefits of working with, uh, with organizations through all sectors in the North American economy is that we can cherry pick best practices in both the public and the private sector. And uh, one of the regions that uh, we support is, is out west in the Silicon Valley area, where as you know, is, is very, uh, his, is a historic place for, for tech startups. And one of the, the historic sayings that uh, we often hear out there is that, Good boards don't create good companies, but a bad board will kill a company every time. And what this is meant to be is a reminder that the composition of your board, the membership of your board, definitely will have an impact on the overall success and performance of your organization. And so when organizations are starting out, the advice they get is don't take it lightly. It's a very serious thing that you're embarking on. Recently, I came across another quote that I that I really like, and this this one is uh, by Pearl Zhu, and she says the board's role is to pull management out of the trees to see the forest, and that's a tough one. That's really about board taking a high level overview approach, and really focusing on that broad scale strategy of your organization, not getting down into the weeds and looking at the, the full forest. So what is a typical story? How have funds gotten into the situation that they're in? Any fund that is um, underfunded and is feeling pressured, there, there's a typical trend or, or story that, that we are hearing. 
And it usually starts out with a young, ambitious uh, politician who campaigns. And obviously, when they're campaigning, they, they have these great ideas and they get a lot of support and energy behind them. People say, yes, I definitely would like this person representing our, our community. Definitely, I want them helping. I think they have some really good ideas. But when they get into office, suddenly they find out that the aspirations that they campaigned on can actually be brought to reality because of financial issues. So usually there's deficits that they're dealing with. And now they're saying, with these constraints, how can I deliver on what I actually campaigned on? And so they start running the numbers and they ask you know, uh, the, the, the management team to start looking at ways in which they might be able to save funds, find funds, what have you. And early days, you know, decades ago, when things were really good, they often found the, the local pensions and they said, wow, these pensions are flush with cash and the markets are doing really well. They're actually well funded. They're getting great returns. So probably we don't need to make the same contributions that, that we've been historically making. We might be able to divert some of that money away or even worse, some of them have said, wow, there's a whole slew of money in here maybe we can dip into this fund and fund some of the local things that I would like to achieve and put into our community. And so they would dip into the pension. They would either uh, reduce or go on a complete co-payment holiday or dip into the fund to fund some of these things that they had campaigned on and promised on. And usually time would go by, but things were good and the markets were good. You had healthy returns. Everyone was happy. And, and you know, as Peter and I often say, when things are good, people never complain. When the returns are coming in, performance is there, nobody's concerned because everyone's riding high. But over time, we suddenly found out, especially after we've gone through two, now three possible recessions, um, all of a sudden people get shocked when they find out that these pensions, these pension banks, somehow are broken. They've, they've been damaged. And then they get upset and they say, hey, wait a minute, this is not right. These, this is our retirement funds. This is our sustainability, financial sustainability that, that we're playing with. And how dare they um, break our, our beloved pensions? Well, usually what ends up happening is by that time, a new politician has come into that role. The new politician says, wow, I don't want to be saddled. And you can't blame them. They say, well, I don't want to be saddled with these giant deficits and these liabilities that we cannot afford possibly. And so therefore they come in and they say, well, how do we avoid this problem? There's people are upset and, and we need to still fund the things that I've campaigned on. But what's an easy, easy outcome? What's an easy escape in their situation? Well, typically what they do is they point to the board and they say, well, pay no attention to the fact that there was a co-payment holiday for decades or pay no attention to the fact that we dipped into the fund to fund some of the things that are now in the community. But really pay attention to the fact that these funds are being managed by non-professionals, uh, teachers, police officers, firefighters. They're not professional money managers. That's why we're in the situation we're in right now. And oftentimes the public buys in to this argument. They buy into this ruse and they suddenly say, well, yeah, that's correct. And so usually what happens to, again, further avoid that liability, politicians will say, well, let's change this in this board of trustees. Let's change it into a board of directors and, and let's appoint some really highly capable people onto the board. And, and Peter and I have often been brought into situations where um, politicians have been advocating for this. And we come in and we say, no, 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 let's take a sober second thought here, because what you're about to do could very well be detrimental to the overall success and profitability of your fund. And when we walk them through the reason, the rationale behind it, they often say, well, I never thought about that. And Thank you, because we were about to make a really uh, sudden knee-jerk reaction here and, and try and, and change this board. So what are the, po the possible outcomes? If the politician gets their way and the, po and the public is behind them and they say, yes, we need a professional board, well, what can, what can be the possible outcomes here? Well, if you have outside so-called professional appointees, some of the positives here, they can bring additional skills and knowledge to the table, that's true they can possibly provide unbiased views 
if they've been appointed and are not beholden to the person that has that has appointed them to this board, it's possible they can be unbiased. But some of the negatives, some of the cons here are they don't have skin in the game. They're not financially tied to the success of the fund themselves. So therefore, it, it's not as personal and immediate to them. And they can provide a biased view as well, especially if the politician that appointed them ha has an agenda and really wants to start playing with the numbers, playing with the, the um, actuarial assumptions, contribution rates, things like that. They can have a whole board that totally supports their views and opinions and agenda. And therefore, um, they oftentimes will win and the members oftentimes will, will not have their best interests being managed. But what happens if the opposite occurs, where you have a member-based board? Well, members, they do have skin in the game. And it's Warren Buffett who, who coined that phrase when he started Berkshire Hathaway. He would go around to potential uh, clients and they would say, well, why would I invest in your fund? And his immediate answer would be, because my money is already in the fund. I'm in there investing alongside of you. I have skin in the game. And, and that is something that really has, has taken hold in the investment community. And it's an expectation that uh, in the private sector, it's expectation that all board members and senior executives should have equity and skin in the game related to the overall financial success and outcomes of the organization that they're overseeing. One of the other positives that can occur is that these member trustees, they understand the member issues and concerns intimately because they are one. They oftentimes, members are also their friends, family, relatives, so they know firsthand what their views and opinions and concerns are. Some of the negatives associated with this, which is what often uh, politicians will focus on, is that maybe they're not as professional or strong in their oversight, oversight skills as they could or should be. And, and but that is a possible con, but what we do know is that trustees can learn. Trustees are actually capable of learning. And, and that is what we advocate, that education, understanding, um, sharpening your skills is the best way to move forward in terms of having an overall effective board uh, for public pensions. When we, treat, when, we, when we approach the accredited fiduciary program, everything is based on the key fiduciary duties of a board member. First and foremost is a duty of loyalty. Loyalty, not to your appointee, not to a constituency, but to the fund, the entire fund itself, and to all of its members in, to, in totality. That's hard for often for, for many trustees because you tend to be beholden to that uh, chief group that has nominated and election, elected you in. But truly, once you're at that board, you are beholden, you are always going to be working in the best interest of the entire fund. That goes for appointees as well. Sitting at the table, they have to have the full fund's best interests at heart in every decision that they contribute towards. Next is prudence. This is uh, uh, like the, the rational man test where have you actually asked all the questions you need to ask? Have you done your smell test? Have you done your due diligence? Before you, you vote on something, before you actually pass any sort of judgment, have you asked everything that you can? to make sure that you are truly confident in the best of your ability that you're doing the right thing for your full fund. And finally, impartiality, making sure that you're, you're not uh, trying to uh, support one group over another, okay? You, and you're also being impartial in terms of the services and the service providers that are being brought to the table, making sure that everything again is in the best interest of the entire fund. What we often know, even the most capable boards, the most competent, professional, what have you, the, the most capable boards, we always know that board members don't know what they don't know. And uh, even people who have been on boards for a long, long time, they are always trying to increase their skills, their knowledge, improve their capabilities, because there's always something out there that they don't know. And it's always pursuing knowledge to improve themselves on a constant basis that makes them a very well-trusted and empowered board member um, for their board. When we talk about the material impacts of governance, we know that it costs a lot. 
And this is something that, that astounds us where when you attend your, your, your average uh, public pension conference, they're usually inundated with investment professionals. And they're all talking about saving, you know, increasing a few basis points here, a few basis points there, protecting uh, risk, uh, you know, dealing with alpha and beta and J curves. And, and they're always talking their jargon and everyone's sitting there thinking, okay, it's all about the investments. But when you talk about governance, it is low hanging fruit. So a study was done in 2007 prior to the economic decline at the, the fall of that year. And it was done by Keith M. Bashir, and it was, it was a global study of major pensions throughout the world. I believe it was over 187, I believe, that participated. And what they concluded is that poor government, poor, poor governance costs pensions one to 2% annually. That is 100 to 200 basis points on your entire fund it can cost you annually. That is a serious material impact on your fund when you're chasing one or two basis points in an asset class here and there. And when they look at the key factors associated with poor governance, one is having some sort of financial capability and oversight in your board. Uh, board composition and skills being uh, very serious about who's on your board and how they're skilled and what skills they need. Conducting board evaluations and being very serious on the overall capabilities and effectiveness on your board and, and oftentimes running evaluations to make sure that you're constantly finding ways to improve your board. Having clarity on board and management roles, making sure that your management is not overstepping into that, that governance oversight capability and that your board is not stepping onto the management's toes as well, making sure that everyone is efficiently working towards their mandate and their objectives. And finally, um, making sure that your board has a high performance culture with competitive compensation. That includes having some sort of incentive plan in place that is risk mitigated and only in sense and only pays out for positive benefits that are brought, financial benefits that are brought to your fund and your members. A more recent study that just came out tells a similar story, but in, from a different angle. And this actually came from uh, Boston College, I believe, and it was just came out in 2019 is public pension board they're looking at the composition and the returns associated with the composition of their boards what they found is that again a material impact good governance can gain pensions 24 basis points annually over in, in their 10-year ten 10-year ten returns and some of the key elements associated with this is the structure the size of your board stakeholder representation financial actuarial expertise and tenure of your board members. We're gonna get into each of these in a, in a more, uh, more detailed level um, in, in a second here. Now I'm, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Peter Landers, who will start going through some of these best practices that were outlined in this study. Perfect, thanks Brad. And uh, thanks to meet you all. Peter Landers, a partner at Global Governance Advisors. And you know, Brad walked you through some of the key elements and all of these in some form or fashion relate back to the role that you as uh, public pension plan trustees, as, mem as representatives of your members, or if you are uh, appointed by governments, really speak to the overall structure of, uh, of your board and that you need to have good representation at the end of the day. And so one fiduciary board should assure a holistic view of responsibilities. So making sure that you're covering all of the, the different roles, whether it relates to audit and finance, compensation, governance, uh, benefits, uh, you know, your legislative committees, making sure that that board is covering all of the responsibilities that uh, it is meant to. So structure being a very important one. Investment and administrative decisions have to have positive impacts. So again, making sure that you're doing a good job providing that oversight of investment and administrative decisions. And again, all areas where you as trustees, whether it's an appointee or someone elected uh, by members, can gain further education on and grow your skill sets at the end of the day in any one of those uh, those areas. If we look to, you know, they looked at things and said, you know, if we look at decision making and if you're making decisions in a shy, in a silo, you know, that leads to generally short-term focus. And it can be harmful to other areas of responsibility. So if you're making decisions, you know, in sort of silos and not having that holistic view with all the different viewpoints, 
uh, from a structure perspective, you may not be making uh, decisions that are in the long-term best interest of the fund. So it's important to have the right structure in place. And by having the right structure and the right composition in place and proactively reviewing that, it will assure you that you have the appropriate skills, experience and expertise so when we speak to that, we say, do you have, you know, that financial and actuarial experience? You know, do people have different experiences being, yes, a member, but have they sat on other boards? Have they, you know, done different things in life? And what different areas of expertise do they bring to the table at the end of the day? You want to make sure you have that. And then most importantly, making sure you have that stakeholder representation. So again, you know, it's not enough to just have, quote unquote, a professional uh, board in place, you wanna make sure you have the representation from those stakeholders because they're gonna have important views as, as you all do on you know, the issues that people are facing and how the fund can best address uh, the issues at the end of the day. So we often say this because it comes up a lot in a lot of our discussions. They say, well, we have a limited pool of candidates to work from. We have this membership group and this membership group and the government appoints these representatives. And while we definitely realize that there are you know, challenges that come with that, the important thing to always remember is you'll never get what you don't ask for. And so if you don't have that inventory of the types of skills that you need, the types of experiences that you need, and aren't able to communicate those to you know, your, uh, your plan sponsor or to different membership groups uh, within your fund, you're never gonna get those skill sets. So having an understanding of the skills that you need is an important tool that, you know, when that next nomination comes up, you know the types of skills uh, that you need and you can ask for uh, them to look into anyone that may have uh, those skills and demonstrates uh, those skill sets at the end of the day. And one way in which you can do that is through a skills matrix. And this assessment basically allows you to look at where the fund is today where you want it to be in the future, and then be able to you know, find uh, either individuals uh, that have those skills or provide an overall you know, education program for your members that builds up their skill sets in a variety of areas. And it's really those additional skills that you need in the future that you wanna be focusing on. And what we know is by doing that, by looking at those you know, existing and future skills gaps, it's gonna strengthen your overall governance practices. It's gonna help you to identify uh, the capabilities, experience and skills and knowledge of your current trustees. Where are the lapses? Where can we benefit not only from individual educational opportunities, but if we have an area that's a big hole across our entire board, maybe this is a great opportunity at uh, a board offsite or within a specific board meeting to bring in, bring in an expert in a specific area and have them speak to the entire board all at once. So everyone's hearing the same message at the same time. And Brad and I have done a lot of those types of sessions over the years where boards have identified, you know what, our entire board or committee needs uh, education in this area and they've structured uh, the, the teaching accordingly uh, to resolve that. And again, two important areas that this helps address, one is, individual trustee education so you all can build up your overall uh, skill sets uh, and experiences and if needed allow you to recruit those additional uh, trustees at the end of the day from your membership base or ask your plan sponsor uh, for people that may have those expertise to help round out your board at the end of the day and so it's important if you haven't already thought of it to have that skills matrix in, in place and think through what are the skills you need and where are you lacking? Because it's a really powerful tool moving forward. The next area we're gonna talk about is board size. This was identified in that Boston College study. And it actually showed that a total of six to 10 board members is optimal at the end of the day, because this allows for adequate stakeholder representation. So you can get enough of your you know, representatives that are elected by your, uh, by your membership and also potentially uh, members of your, your plan sponsor. It actually allows for efficient meetings and committee structures as well. Um, you know, Brad, I, I recall a situation uh, at GGA specifically a few years back where we were advising a board that had, I think, over 30 
uh, board members and it just led to dragged on meetings and not getting you know to the the key important details at the end of the day and we actually helped them in terms of streamlining uh, the number of board members moving forward and it made a huge difference uh, in how their board was able to operate and so again it allows for more efficient meetings when you have a manageable amount of, of numbers and still provides enough numbers to set up audit committees and governance committees and benefits committees and legislative committees so that everyone is sharing in the responsibilities at the end of the day. And what the study also found is by having six to 10 members, you also have an adequate and diverse composition of skills. So that allows you to identify the important skills that your board needs and be able to address them uh, through the selection of, uh, of trustees at the end of the day. So really important that if you can uh, keep to within that six to 10 the most common number I think we typically see is nine, uh, but anywhere in that six to 10 range, uh, you know, is found to be best practice at the end of the day. And what we've also found through our years and years of experience working with uh, funds is that there is a propensity as the size of the fund grows to also grow the, the size of the board. And while that might make sense, if you have that small board, maybe it's only made up of five individuals and maybe you need to get it up to six, seven, eight, um, if you're starting to get into the, the low to mid teens, even getting higher than that, you're really starting to lose the efficiency that can come from a reasonable size uh, number of members. And I think it's important to realize that if you've done a good job in terms of setting up that board skills matrix and understanding the skills that you need and what you're lacking, you can actually, through that process, through that composition, be able to cover all of those required skill sets and experiences through that six to 10 member board. You don't need 20 members uh, to, to get all of those skills at the end of the day. When we look at things like looking at size and bringing on new members, a planned succession process is important. It's, a, it's amazing to Brad and I how many times we walk into uh, boards. And it's not just pension fund boards, it's all boards and they haven't done a good job of planning for their succession. One of their executive director or their CEO, but also of the board in general. And this is where a proactive board succession plan can really help. And when you've developed those skill sets with all of your trustees, this will limit the potential for blowback of people saying, well, we need to professionalize the board because you have this succession plan in place, you understand the skill sets, you're growing the skills and knowledge of your board uh, trustees on a regular basis and you're able to be proactive in what you're doing and it allows you to maintain work capacity and continue to operate the business in an appropriate fashion so that you know you're not turning over six seven members at a time a nice planned succession maybe it's one maybe two maybe even three uh, board members at a time you can still keep the majority uh, of your trustees with a working knowledge that have that experience and can keep things uh, running while your new uh, trustees are getting up to speed. It also allows you to be positive with your communication with stakeholders. So you can say, we're proactively planning for our succession. And what a lot of organizations will do, and we're starting to see more and more of the leading pension funds do this, is actually communicate to their stakeholders in their annual report about the skill sets that they're looking for and how their current trustees uh, stack up uh, against those skill sets and where and all the different educational opportunities that uh, they're providing to their uh, to their uh, trustees on an annual basis to build upon their existing skill sets so you can be more proactive and have that positive communication on a regular basis with your stakeholders it also allows you to have an adequate number of prepared and targeted nominees so you know you have that general process that you know nominees are coming up on an annual basis. Maybe you have one or two or three uh, trustees all up for a vote at once. They should be, if they are planning on stepping down from your board or are forced to step down, giving you proper notice so that again, you can work with that uh, plan sponsor or with uh, the membership base to identify those skill sets that that person might be giving up by stepping off the board. And can they find someone at the end of the day that target that's targeted that has those specific skills and they can and they're interested in joining the board so it allows you uh, for that as well and a basic a strong five-step plan can really help you in managing this so it all starts with articulating the business strategy just like we talked about 
you're then going to assess uh, the leadership and the competencies required to implement that strategy, both now and into the future. You're then going to assess all of your trustees, again, using that skills matrix uh, to see where they have current skills and where they might be lacking. You then can put that development planning cycle and figure out what are the educational opportunities we need to do to build our overall board skill sets. And then ultimately, when you've put a plan in place, regularly be monitoring, measuring, and evolving that plan as the needs of your board changes. So if we look at you know, 10, 12 years ago, cybersecurity risk and cybersecurity knowledge probably wasn't as high on the to-do list, but now it's becoming more and more uh, of a necessity for all boards to be aware of. So again, you need to evolve your, uh, your processes and your development plans to make sure that people are getting at least a high level working knowledge of the risks they should be aware of at the end of the day. So always be tinkering and following this five-step plan at the end of the day. If we look at you know stakeholder representation, this is probably the most important aspect that came out of that Boston College study. It showed that having a minimum of 20% and up to 70% of the board made up of stakeholder uh, representatives like members and not these quote unquote professional trustees or board members really makes for an optimal board because it allows for an open and clear line of communication and an understanding of all the issues amongst all of the different uh, trustees. It also, uh, when you look at it, allows for membership views and different uh, viewpoints of different membership groups. Maybe you have fire and police uh, combined on your board, allows the concerns of the firemen and the concerns of the police to be uh, to be heard because they may have different issues, but it also allows the plan sponsors uh, viewpoints to also uh, come into play. So you have to have that good balance between all the different stakeholders uh, as well. If we look at other things, it addresses those stakeholder concerns, like I mentioned before, and it ultimately allows for greater stakeholder buy-in and a higher probability of support. And why is that? That's because all of the different stakeholders are represented around the table, their views have been heard, and a decision has been made that tries to, as much as possible, balance out the concerns of all of those different groups. So there's not a situation where one group is thinking that they've been sh uh, shut out of the process. And if someone feels like they've been shut out of the process, they're most likely going to push back and not buy in as quickly into whatever plan uh, your fund has come in. So all of these things, allow you to get that wider span of support amongst all the different stakeholders uh, as it relates to plan changes or different things that you're doing at your pension fund. And then what also has been found is the lack of representation leads to that lost time, the energy and resources, because you're now outside of your regular board meetings, potentially having to do town halls and different sessions with different stakeholders because their viewpoints weren't necessarily discussed as part of the initial board discussion. So that's leading to inefficiency and those extra meetings at the end of the day and potential for pushback in a debate. So again, having that stakeholder representation is critical to make sure that all of the viewpoints are heard and everyone uh, is able to make a decision that balances out all of those concerns at the end of the day. We look at financial expertise, and this is an area where you know, potentially, uh, you know, bringing on uh, an up appointee with specific experience can be helpful, but it assures that you have board independence and that you have that working knowledge from an audit perspective and from even a, you know, an actuarial perspective to be able to question, uh, you know, some of the assumptions that are going into these uh, analyses. It allows you to have an ability to keep your service providers accountable and provides for direct and indirect education opportunities. And this is an area where a lot of uh, trustees get a lot of experience on the investment side. There's all these conferences, different seminars around beta and alpha, and, uh, small cap, mid cap, global equities, domestic equities, private equity, infrastructure, all these different things. But also looking at different ways in which uh, your trustees can build upon their financial or their actuarial expertise. And some of this will come through time through sitting on various committees, but are there other seminars and things that you can build up the skill sets of those people that may not have a full background in those areas to make them, you know, get them up to speed even faster 
these are the types of things uh, we're talking about in terms of educating uh, people and making sure that all of your trustees uh, can can get up to speed. And when we look at you know that expertise, if you don't have that experience, if you don't have that financial acumen, it puts you at a disadvantage because you're not able to maybe uh, enact that level of prudence and that level of questioning that Brad mentioned uh, as part of your fiduciary duties because you don't necessarily have the skill sets and the experience to be able to uh, adequately question uh, service providers and different assumptions. So again, making sure you have that expertise is ultimately gonna allow you to act in the best interest of the fund and make sure that you're uh, protecting members' interest. The other question that comes up and we have to answer is asking about you know, good board members. What we say is good board members ask good questions. And if you don't know the right questions to ask, then and you don't have that necessary skill set that can you know make it challenging to ask those good questions at the end of the day but good member board members ask good questions and how do you go about uh, doing that at the end of the day you know and we ask about board tenure and we talked about you know succession planning and things like that healthy turnover does assure that your board members you know get an adequate change in terms of the views the opinions and the approaches uh, of different groups so it allows for that that adequate uh, change in the views it allows a maintenance of, of knowledge as well so you don't want your board to be turning over every year or every second year you want to have some continuity throughout the time period so that they can then get those newer members up to speed faster on the issues that your board is facing so that maintenance of that knowledge is critical and then as well, what was found from the study was an agreed best practice was three terms of three years. So a total of nine years is the optimal amount of time because that allows you to gain that institutional knowledge, but also allows you to, you know, after a 10, 12 year period, it starts to question if you are acting in a fully independent manner and are you questioning uh, things enough or are you just getting into the same pattern of doing things the same way over and over. So that three three year term, three consecutive terms, nine years total is a good rule of thumb. And again, this is where you can have those good discussions around potential you know, membership uh, members that are looking like high potentials that might be good board members. This allows you through a scheduled 10 year process to be able uh, to get that adequate turnover and get some new blood on the board at the end of the day. And then the last thing, before I turn it back uh, to Brad to finish things off is, we know that given its identified impact, that pensions need to make good governance a priority. You saw the one to 2% that it costs, the 24 basis points that it can add over time. And so all through this, you know, in terms of your boards and representative boards, making sure that you're getting adequate knowledge, making sure that you're pro uh, practicing proper governance practices, always looking to increase your skill sets, that's the type of priority you want to be taking and making sure that you can that you're ultimately acting in the best interest of your plan members and all of you that are on this call obviously have a commitment to education that's why you're on this webinar but you need to make sure that you're uh, making good governance a priority and giving it the attention it deserves excellent peter thank you so when we talk about good governance, uh, as I said before, Peter and I often say that this is low hanging fruit from a material impact on your fund. It is something that is within your immediate span of control and influence. And so when you look at good governance, well, how do you strengthen it? How do you make sure that you have a very proactive, growing uh, board, increasing in their education, their competencies, their capabilities? How do you do that? Well, a good good way to start is just starting with an effectiveness assessment. Uh, for those of you who haven't done one in years or haven't done one at all, we would highly recommend that you take a look at this because again, it's something very simple and easy that's within your span of control that can have an immediate impact on your, your fund. It allows you to assess your overall capabilities, to establish a proactive plan around that, 
And then how do you continuously improve? And then continuous, and then again, assess, plan, and improve. It is a virtuous cycle that your board should, should be embracing. These assessments, they're necessary, they're impactful, and they are considered a best practice in both the public and private sector governance spheres. They help you to identify and uncover deficiencies. Just running an assessment and, and airing dirty laundry is not a best practice, but identifying deficiencies and then deciding how you can overcome these deficiencies is definitely a proactive way of using this tool. It helps you to revisit or determine your board skills and expertise especially around finance, investment, risk management, human capital management, which is often something that is overlooked by many boards, especially in the public sector sphere, because they feel that that accounting, that finance, that investment uh, responsibility is their first and foremost responsibility. Human capital actually also has a performance impact and a material impact, because it, it again, as we often say, it is uh, it's, an, it's an asset that your organization has and you should be managing it in a very capable way. And finally, it, it also allows you to uh, look at your contracts, reviewing your contracts, negotiating contracts. Uh, public funds spend billions of dollars on an annual basis to external service providers. It, the Wall Street thrives on it. And, and any of you who have taken the NAF, the accredited fiduciary program, or considering taking the fiduciary program, um, something that we talk a lot about. Understanding that the contracts, where your money's going, what are the performance parameters around it, and, and how your fund is, is actually benefiting, should always be benefiting from the, the, con the contractual outcomes and not necessarily just be continuously paying um, for non-performance. And finally, they, these assessments help you to strategically evolve and improve your board capabilities in terms of establishing education and training opportunities and, and strategic recruitment of board members that will help you to fill some of the skills gaps that are identified. Oftentimes, we have funds that will call up Peter and myself and they'll say, yes, we want you to come and educate our board. Well, what do you want to be educated on? Have you assessed yourself? Do you know specifically what you need because the last thing peter and i want to do is to come in and waste your time energy and resources on something that you don't need or your members don't need or your fund doesn't need we want you to be targeted making sure that you're you're prudent in your actions and making sure that you're getting exactly what it is that's going to have a a, a significant material impact on your fund sometimes it's not bringing peter and myself in sometimes it's bringing in someone else who's a subject matter expert in a better in another area that your board can be better served by. So again, if you're not assessing yourself, you'll never be able to be strategic and really focus on where your resources need to be best invested. When you conduct an assessment, there, there's two key buckets of, of benefits here. Um, one is the, the direct benefits and the other are indirect benefits. And, and oftentimes boards never think about the indirect benefits. They're always focused on the direct benefits. And when we talk about direct benefits, they help to ensure that the board has the, cap the capacity, the skills to provide proper oversight, strategic oversight, not man man meddling in the, in the weeds, as we would say, that they truly are mitigating risk and that they are providing strategic guidance on an ongoing basis for their fund that their board is, is meeting all of its professional expectations and required compliance, uh, making sure that you're not misaligned with, with any of the legal requirements of, of your fund and, and making sure that you're, you're constantly doing what you need to do, especially fulfilling your fiduciary, your key fiduciary role as, as a, a member of your board. On the indirect side, these evaluations also help to educate board members. And, and when, I, when I say this, I mean, oftentimes when we go through uh, a significant uh, board evaluation questionnaire, participants will get to certain sections and they'll say, wow, I didn't even know that this was something that we're supposed to be uh, looking at or responsible for on an ongoing basis. Wow, this is a whole a whole area that we have been uh, not adequately fulfilling for quite some time now. 
And just by virtue of having a question in a survey, it actually piques that board member's interest or multiple board members' interest to say, wow, we need to cover this. And, uh, and it's a way to avoid embarrassment too, because now you could say, well, we, we just discovered this and we're going to cover it, not someone else pointing this out and saying, how could you not have known this? How could you not have been covering off this whole area? So it's, it's, it's subtle, but it has a significant impact in direct, indirectly educating board members. It helps you to identify problems, uh, either in groups, individuals, et cetera. And, and this is done in an anonymous way. And that's one of the key elements of, of running these things is that they have to be done not in a public way, but in a very anonymous and protected way so that board members are able to speak their mind and, and, and speak without you know, possible repercussion. And, and oftentimes, you know, we always know there's politicking that takes place within a boardroom in every type of board. And, and so by running through an anonymous survey and, and, and interviews where you can air your, your opinions, your views, your concerns in a very protected way is a great way to really identify the problems that uh, your fund is encountering or has been encountering for, for quite some time. We're always amazed that at the end of, of an evaluation, oftentimes uh, board members are, are, are very um, relieved because something that they thought they were an outlier on that they wanted to address, um, they suddenly find out that vast majority or, or a, a vast number of people on the board had the exact same view and opinion, but just no one spoke up. And, and this is an opportunity to, again, be relieved to feel that you're, you're not the outlier, you're not the only one that was concerned about whatever it is that uh, you've discovered. It also helps you to generate proactive improvement plans. Again, if you're just running an assessment and, and, and shelving the, the, the responses and not putting it into uh, a, a proactive plan on how you're going to break out the, the various elements that you've identified and things that you need to improve and, and chunk away at it. You say, you know, how do you how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. The same is, is same is true for, for governance. There's oftentimes there's low hanging fruit, things that can be easily addressed and have tremendous impact, or things that are, um, are incredibly risky that you've never realized you've been doing and you need to change really quickly. Or there's mid, medium term, as we would say, medium term priorities, things that uh, you can take a bit more time in addressing or will take a bit more time in addressing, but at least you identified them and you're, you're going to put together a game plan around it. And then finally, what are the long term objectives and things that you can address and, and focus on that it, you're not going to be done this year or next year, or maybe in three to five years. Um, but these are definitely things that will have an impact the long term uh, of your organization. As a general rule for, for evaluations, if you haven't done an assessment um, at all, or if you haven't done an assessment in a number of years, you need to do a deep dive. You need to come in, and typically these are done about every three years. And this is typically done by a third party, primarily to protect the, uh, the, the views, opinions, the, the identity of participants so that they can speak freely. It usually would also include interviews so people can uh, so that the people running the survey can ask a bit more pointed questions, really dive into the results, and we're getting some, some proactive views, opinions, uh, potential solutions from your members, identifying an action plan or an improvement work plan that your board can, can address. And typically that would be your governance committee that would take over that work plan and to own it. And, and um, you know, as I said, if, it, if you haven't done one, in the past and this is the first time it, it definitely you need to do it and it also helps you to uh, address if there are serious issues that uh, need to be addressed uh, quickly or that are in incurring any unnecessary risk within your fund shallow dive this is something that would happen after you've done a real deep dive so these are just doing a light survey getting into maybe some of the key areas that were identified in in the the the, the more inclusive or deeper dive, just to say, uh, how are we doing? You know, one year out, two years out, uh, um, are we actually making progress in the things that we said we were going to change or work towards changing? And, and it's just kind of a, a pulse check, as we would say. 
this gives you it's it's a usually something really short and quick um your object you're looking at key objectives are you making progress and and also it gives you again an opportunity for board members to identify issues that that are, are that they see coming because the last thing you ever want to get back to that deep dive and you suddenly discover that there was a looming problem that you just were not aware of for a number of years that you could have addressed or identified um, earlier on. So again, it helps you to, to alleviate and mitigate risk. A good assessment should always provide clarity on whether or not your board is meeting the expectations or requirements of your fund. Are they performing both individuals and as a team and when we say team, we don't mean the, the member represent, representatives versus the appointees. No, as a team, as a whole, the appointees and the trustees, elected trustees, are you working as a team? And then finally, do you have, I, have you generated ideas for improvement? Is there a way forward for you to actually benefit from this assessment, these results? so that you're, again, on that improvement track, making sure that you're constantly uh, making yourself more capable and better. If you're proactively managing your composition through um, skills uh, matrices and, and identifying um, whether or not you're effective in, in the skills that you have on your board and the composition of your board, the numbers, the represent, representation that we addressed in, in this, this, uh, this webinar, it will help you to negate any perceived need to blow up a board. We strongly encourage you, encourage you to be proactive, engage with these best practices, and then report on them. Talk about them, brag about them, that you're actually doing this because while you're doing this, any of the naysayers out there that are saying that you're not being proactive, you're, you need to be changed, that professionals need to be on your board, you actually have a track record that you can put in front of your stakeholders to say, no, we're doing everything possible to take this seriously, and we're doing everything possible to fully meet the needs and the interests of our members and stakeholders. We're not saying you should have a full board that's comprised of elected uh, member representatives. You need to have the, your, your sponsor stakeholders at the table as well. There needs to be a balance, and if you can maintain that and show that you're being uh, proactive politicians will never you'll be bulletproof they'll never be able to to uh, to criticize because you're constantly showing that you're being proactive in managing this composition on your board as as deliverers of the NCPERS accredited fiduciary program we often challenge the the, the participants in the program and when you look at the the material return opportunities and impacts that governance has on your pension. How can a pension trustee say, yeah, we're just gonna give up on governance, we're wholeheartedly focusing on our investment responsibilities and that's it. Well, because most public pensions, they are slow to assess their governance practices in recent, in recent years. They, are, they have not reviewed their foundational documents and guiding policies for uh, many, many years. They are not introducing performance plans that incent the right behaviors in their executives. They are beholden to a pay band structure and they're not actually finding tools, best practice tools that are out there. They're not bringing their board into the 90s or the 2000s. They're still printing out board packages and mailing them out and everyone's using paper and they're not actually taking uh, some of the digital tools that are available to them and using them in best interests of their fund. A common, common response, Peter and I often hear is this is the way we've always done it. Trustees before us did it this way. I've been doing it this way for multiple years. This is the way we've always done it without actually questioning why. Why are we doing it this way? How might we, may we improve? Our ongoing challenge to our NAF participants is always if you take our accredited fiduciary program and you do not act, if you take the time to sit in the classroom, to hear the lectures, to participate in the exam, you get the accreditation and you still don't take action in the boardroom to improve the overall competency of your board, then in our minds, you have given up because you've been given all the education and tools to start asking good questions, to get your board on a, on a more stable track, 
And, and if you don't act, then truly you have given up. And that uh, the people who are uh, believe that uh, status quo is the way it should be, they will always be the winners. So with that, I'm, we're, it takes us to the end. We're going to open this up for questions. Are there any questions that uh, you have? I know this was a short webinar, but uh, are there any questions around governance, its impact, uh, a, a positive process for uh, board assessment that you might want to look at that will help to materially impact the overall yeah. success of your fund? Yeah, thanks, Brad. Thanks, Peter. Yes, we have a number of questions. Uh, so let me start right away. What is your view of adding independent members to pension board's audit committee? This keeps the representative board model, but adds professional ability and public perspective to the important audit function. Uh, it, only if it's identified as a need. So if you've done a skills matrix assessment, you've identified what skills you have on your board, and if that uh, financial expertise or, or audit expertise is something that your board is, is, is sorely missing, then there could be benefits to that. But always make sure that there is um, a process in place that both the, the uh, sponsor and the members have a process to both feed into who gets selected. Because again, you want to make sure that interests on both sides are, are being addressed. Next question. How do you overcome resistance to term limits? You state this is a best practice, but both elected and appointed trustees tend to serve for many, many years. <laughs> this, is, this is a tough one, because again, people get complacent. And we're not saying that people are, are you know, past due. Um, oftentimes, they're great contributors. But there is a, a recognized best practice around having a healthy churn. And, and you may have one or two board members that you just can't let go of, but oftentimes there are other board members that you'd like to let go of. So you can't have your cake and eat it too in this situation. So you, you need to look at it and say, this is the best practice, this is in the best interest. And, and so how do new board members come in and maybe leverage the, the knowledge and expertise of, of an outgoing board member so that uh, that institutional knowledge is not lost? So that that is a possible way of keeping them involved, but not having them as a formal member of your board. And if you've also put in place a formal policy on it, then it really, as someone is you know, taking on the position, um, as they're getting onboarded, they understand that there is this term limit and that they will only serve for, let's say, nine years maximum. And so you know, people then have that understanding when they, uh, when they are joining your board and potentially for those that maybe were on before the uh, tenure, you could even consider grandfathering uh, the policy maybe for existing members, but make it more forward-looking for any new uh, trustees that are added afterwards. So potential way there to uh, mitigate that. And just as a quick follow-up, do you have any um, suggestions on how to adopt that policy again, given that the board would have to approve it and presumably there would be some resistance to that? Well, I, I think first and foremost, you need to educate everyone on the, the best practices and how it is, from a loyalty and prudent standpoint, the be, in the best interest of your fund. And it's often hard to step down, especially if you've been a, a diligent and dedicated and committed trustee for years on end. But if you can understand the benefits behind that, then uh, then again, it, it, it's it's acting on the best interest of your fund. And, and if you approach it from that standpoint, it, it, it tends to make it a bit easier in terms of the implementation. And again, the if you consider as one alternative grandfathering it in for existing uh, trustees, then uh, potentially that can be a, a way to get some naysayers on side if they feel like their own individual thing isn't being threatened at that specific time. But that's definitely something for boards to have a good discussion on whether that grandfathering makes sense or not. Great, another question. One observation about a board is that not enough trustees engage in the work or discussion or one trustee dominates the conversation. Any advice for obtaining the right amount of participation or engagement? That's, that's where the, the assessments really shine because when you start looking at uh, individual contributions um, and and people see the results 
we're we're a strong, strong uh, supporter of um, giving people an opportunity to change. So if I, in any of the boards I sit on, if my peers said that it's obvious I'm not contributing to the to the full extent or capability that that I could or should, I'd be embarrassed. And and so I would now take do everything possible to change that opinion of me to make sure that uh, I am shining as much as possible in that boardroom. Oftentimes it also has to do with a certain level of complacency where people know that certain individuals dominate, so why bother? And that often also leads to them not properly preparing to go into a meeting. They're not going through all the materials. They're, they're not um, a, a properly preparing themselves for a, board for a board meeting. And so therefore, when they sit in the room, they're incapable of asking the right questions because they just have not adequately gone through the materials. And again, a board assessment will flag this and, and people will say, wow, like I, it's people notice that I'm, I'm not prepared. Therefore, I'm now going to do everything possible to show up to board meetings uh, fully, fully armed and, and ready um, for, for a, a good conversation about all these issues. And it's also the assessment allows those individuals to feel like maybe their voices aren't as loud around the table to have their voice heard through this confidential uh, process, not only being able to rate uh, the board's performance and individual trustees, their peers, but also if you're doing one-on-one -on -one interviews, it gives them an outlet to speak with an independent third party to share any frustrations they're having as well. And you can find that oftentimes through that type of process, that then opens them up in the future to feel more emboldened to uh, speak around uh, the boardroom table as well. Do you see outside facilitated self-assessments overcoming objections to, you know, quote, airing dirty laundry, close quote, in public? Are there other tools to encourage board to embrace self-assessment? Great question. I'll, I'll answer first and then maybe Brad can uh, respond as well. But um, one thing I will say is, you know, a lot of uh, places, this is where you do working drafts of, uh, of the, the third parties uh, reports. And that gives the ability to, you know, potentially, uh, you know, confidentially deal with some, uh, you know, sensitive issues, um, you know, before they have to um, necessarily, you know, become a final draft and are access to, of course, any sunshine laws. But the other thing that we've seen uh, some organizations do on a more informal basis besides the full-blown assessment is doing very short five to seven question post-meeting uh, questionnaires internally. So asking about, you know, did the meeting focus uh, the discussion on the right topics? Did we receive the materials in enough time before this meeting? What's one improvement you as a trustee would suggest to make the next meeting that more impactful? And if you do these kind of informal, uh, you know, post-meeting questionnaires, you'll be surprised at how many little uh, tidbits of information you can take to improve upon uh, the next meeting uh, as well. So that's one little informal uh, way that internally you can try to make some incremental improvements. It may not deal with, you know, full skills gaps and things like that, but it can lead to, you know, more efficient meetings and maybe getting the materials in more time if people feel like they need more time to prepare. So things like that can be easily adjusted through these sort of informal post-meeting questionnaires. Okay, and then final question. Um, how do you plan trustee um, succession when trustees uh, or employee trustees are elected or appointments are made by, not by the plan? So this goes back to the being proactive um, and the, the comment that we made that a board will never get what they don't ask for. So you may go through the rigor of identifying the, the identified skills and expertise that you need on your board and you know, what is the optimal mix and you've identified gaps and, and you never actually share those results or, or the gaps that you've identified and you hope and pray that either your your members will nominate someone with this background or, or capability or that the the co-sponsor will appoint someone with this 
you, you need to be open and transparent. And if you can go to them and say, we do realize that uh, you're going to be nominating someone new. This is what we're looking for. This is what we need. Do you have anyone in, in your span of control or within your community that has this, this capability? Because this is in the best interest of our fund. And, and you may not get it, but now you have a higher probability of getting it because you, you've been open and, and honest with what your, your board needs. And if you can show the objective results of your, your study, then uh, it, it's quite, it's, it, every, everyone understands that this is something that uh, they need to work toward and they can start looking uh, for, for an ideal nominee for your board. But again, if you're not if you're not communicating that, there's a high probability that you're never going to get what you a good nominee that you you actually have identified that you need. And I think one last thing I'll mention is just making sure that you're getting and having adequate engagement with your membership base as well. Uh, we've often have been in conversations where people say, "Oh, you know, when I was 25 years old, I didn't really care about the pension plan." But now that I'm 40, I have a family. I've been in the, uh, you know, in the city for 10, 15 years. You know, it's a lot more impactful for, uh, to me. So I think it's about having that proactive engagement, making sure that people understand the importance of the the fund as a whole, what it means to their long-term uh, futures in terms of, you know, the the pension and their financial stability and their retirement. And if you can get people proactively engaged at an earlier time and not waiting till they're 50 or 60 years old, you'll then have a more active, I think, base to then work from that if you do have, you know, a, a specific nomination coming up, you'll have hopefully more than one candidate uh, raising up the, their hand to, to volunteer to go up uh, to be elected on. So engaging with them as early as possible and letting them know about the importance of the fund and the work that you're doing can help, I think, in getting that hopefully wider net of uh, potential members to want to step up and, and be a member of the fund and the, and the board. Brad, Peter, thank you for the, your wonderful presentation today and your partnership in the NCPERS Accredited Fiduciary, the NAF program. Truly appreciate uh, your expertise and your willingness to share with our members. Thank you to all of our participants today for joining us. We will not host a session on Thursday in observance of Independence Day, but we will return on Tuesday, July 7th. Have a good fourth, everyone. Have a great fourth. Take care, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.